All right, ma'am, we are going to get started. And these are math questions I've never seen before. So this is kind of like a <laughs> surprise and stump the teacher. So hopefully I can do them. Pretty sure I can, but we'll see what happens. And you said you got these from a, a magical mystery source. So whoever's mm -hmm. watching, if these are your questions, I'm not trying to steal them. I don't know where they came from. So <laughs> <laughs> let's go with this first one. A property is valued at $225,000 and taxed at 30 mils. The assessment rate at the prop on the property is 35%. Calculate the yearly taxes. So do you have any idea on where you would start or what you want to do or anything like that? Um, Honestly, for these ones, I kind of just wanted to break it down. Just how just how would I do it? Yeah, just okay. really breaking it down. I'm like, I just... Well, the first bit. thing I notice is that the property is valued at 225 and mm -hmm. then it says there's an assessment rate on the property of 35%. So just like when you buy something at the grocery store, if you buy something for $5, you know you're going to have to pay tax on that entire $5. Mm -hmm. And what those two things are saying is you're not paying tax on the entire $5. You're paying tax on only 35% of the $5. Except we're going to change the $5 to $225,000. You're not paying taxes based on its market value. Like if you put it on the market and somebody wanted to buy it, whenever you pay taxes, you pay taxes off of the assessed value. And it's telling you the assessed value is 35% of $225,000. So do you know how to find 35% of $225,000? Would um, multiply? Yes, okay. multiply. So <laughs> if you said 225000 times 35%, what do you get? And I'll do it too. Well, let me get some. 78, 75, zero. Let's see. 225 times 35%. 78,750. Now, just it occurred to me while I was having you do that. Whenever you get stuck and you're like, am I supposed to be multiplying or dividing? I kind of always think about multiplying is when I'm trying to find tax, like tipping. If I'm like, oh no, okay, I need to, I want to leave 20%. You know, usually you take the, the restaurant bill and multiply by 20% in your calculator because you're trying to find 20% of your restaurant bill. And when I first started teaching math and I wasn't really great at when I, when do I multiply and when do I divide either? That's what I would go back to. Like I knew that I knew if I want to find the the tip on my my receipt, I would multiply by 20%. I'm trying to find 20% of my bill. Same thing here. We were trying to find 35% of 225. It's like 225 was my restaurant bill. Well, not 225,000, but still. And I'm trying <laughs> to tip them 35%. I don't know if that will help you. If you, you yeah, know. no, yeah. So, it so this is what we call, I call it the ass value, but it's really the assessed. <laughs> I know it just makes me laugh, so I call it that. Sometimes have, I'll be something make us laugh. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I call it AV. It wasn't even about to make y'all laugh. I just like saying ass value, but we'll call it the AV. Maybe, probably not. So <laughs> now you know you pay taxes off of that value, and in this problem, it is talking about mills. So, do you know anything about mills? I'm totally spacing. I'm trying to remember from the last time we met, but it's just... okay. It's okay. So remember, a mill is one tenth of one cent. The value of a mill is one tenth of one cent. Just like a penny is one tenth of ten cents. Yes. Right? That makes sense? Yes. Because if you take a dime, which is 10 cents, and you divide it by 10, you're going to get in the calculator 0 0.01. So a penny is one cent. A mill 
is one tenth of one cent. So if you take that one cent and you divide it by 10, what do you get in your calculator? Uh, 0 0.001. There you go, 0 0.001. And do you remember this is the tenths place and this is the hundredths place? Do you remember all of that from being like little? And this yeah. is the <laughs> Elementary thousandths school. place. So it's about thousand. So whenever you see the word mill, I need you to think like a millennium, a thousand, a mill, a mil, I don't know, a milliliter, one with your thousands. It's it's about that thousand. Or one way to remember it is one zero zero zero. There's four numbers there. M I L L one zero zero zero. You got to remember a thousand. If okay. you can remember that, this is really easy because after that, just divide something by a thousand. Basically, you're saying, well, basically, the easiest way to do this is take the 225,000 and divide it by 1,000. That takes care of the mill. And it's not that you're paying just one mill. You're paying on a rate of 30 mills. And that's how you get your answer. Oh. Yeah, I know. I see the hesitation. What's going on? I typed it. I was typing in the equation. Oh, okay. So you no, said- sorry, I got excited. Oh, sorry. Well, no, no, nope. I take that back because I used 225,000 and we're not being taxed on 225,000. We're being taxed on, remember we did this math up here? The yeah, seven the so yeah, so value. that's gonna be that's why you were giving me that look. You're like, Candace, that's a lot of money. I bet it was. I bet I I absolutely bet it was. Now I want to see what it is. Two hundred and fifty thousand divided by a thousand times thirty would have given you seventy five hundred dollars. Well, in some places that's not a lot of money, but in this case that is not our answer. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try the seventy eight seven fifty divided by a thousand times 30. And how about I got 23.62.50. Let me double check my- Yeah, I want you to double check. Yes. Okay, that sounds better. And this would be your tax amount. So really, it's about two steps. We did a couple of other steps in between. But first, we had to find the assessed value. And then we took that assessed value, divided it by 1,000, and then multiplied by the number of mills. Just two steps. I like that. <laughs> I'll show you a secret. If you take 78,750 and you multiply it by 30, but you divide the 30 by 1,000. So if you divide that 30 by 1,000 instead of dividing the 7850 by 1,000, mm -hmm. you're going to get exactly the same answer. You just got to divide one of the stinking numbers by 1,000. I don't really care which one it is. That's the secret. If you can just remember 1,000 for mil... You're golden. Sorry, trash. That's okay. Don't worry about it. I didn't hear it. Oh, okay. I was like. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. You're like, somebody's coming to kill me. No. <laughs> yeah. I do that all the time. I'm like, what was that noise? Somebody's in the house <laughs> with a knife. They're going to kill me. Yeah. Or it could just be normal everyday stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Oh, Does that help? Yes. Yay! And what are we going to remember when we see the word mill? Thousand. That's right. And we're dividing by a thousand. Divide something by a thousand. But if you mess up and you multiply by a thousand, the number you're going to get is going to be so insane. You're going to be like, no, that's not right. Hold the horse. <laughs> yeah, you're like, <laughs> uh, no, our taxes can't be more than the property is worth. Like, that's just not a thing.
That would be a little scary. <laughs> Very scary. All right. So first problem done. Woohoo. Let's go to our <laughs> next one. Go team. All right. Kathy is a salesperson who receives 40% of the total commission received by her broker from the sale of the house that Kathy listed. What is the broker's net share of the commission if the house sold for $925,000 and the commission rate was 5% and a cooperating broker received half of the commission? That is a lot. Yeah. <laughs> but I think this is an excellent question. Why? Because you could be Kathy. Yeah. And if you sell a $925,000 house, I need to know that you know how much your check is going to be for. Mm -hmm. And for this, I like to draw something that one of my fellow teachers you may have heard of, Travis Everett. He's on YouTube. Which I, he has like this commission tree. And I think it is the world's greatest thing to understand commissions. So I'm just going to write it out. We're going to do a commission tree in general. Okay. So let's say you had a sales price of $100,000. Is that your commission? Do you get $100,000? No. Usually there's like, and I'm just going to use 6% commission here. So if you took $100,000 and you multiplied it by 6%, that means your actual amount of total commission is $6,000. Now you tell me, if you are the agent and there is a 6% commission that the seller paid, are you, the agent, going to get all $6,000? Mm -mm. No, because it, it's not actually you, it's the firm. Let's say you are the listing agent. You listed this property. Your firm charged the seller 6%. But a lot of times it's going to be split between the listing firm and the selling firm. And the selling firm is the buyer's agent. Because think about what the, we're talking about the firms, this agent, the broker, because the broker usually starts a company. I tend to call it a firm, but you know, the company. Mm -hmm. There's one company, one broker that is officially who listed the property. There's another broker or firm or whoever who sold the property. So we're talking about the actions they took. One was the listing company. One was the selling company. Now, usually, I'm not even going to say usually, for math that you do in here, this could be a 50% split, mm -hmm. which means one side is getting 50%. And the other side is getting 50%. So what is 50% of $6,000? $3,000? Yep. We don't even need the calculator for that. Mm -hmm. And that's your broker. That's the broker or the firm. Are they going to let you take all of that $3,000? No. Let's say they say, okay, you the agent get something, and then the broker keeps something. And I'm just going to make up a number. Maybe it's a, you get 70% and the broker keeps 30%. So if you, the agent, get 70% of that $3,000, how much would you get? Oh boy, that was... Ooh. No, did you hit something wrong? And that's okay. If you get a crazy number, then, all right. So you might have divided, I'm assuming. Yeah, I got like 42,000. Yeah. Like, oh, and the broker's not paying you more money than you received. We get that. So let's try multiplying. <laughs> yeah, I think that'll work better. Because <laughs> it's like your restaurant bill was, you know, $3,000. And for whatever reason, you're tipping them 70%. I don't know why you would, but... Okay. Just feeling generous. <laughs> generous day. Uh, you there you go. And just to finish this off, how much does that mean the broker is going to take? If they're giving you $2,100, how much do they get to keep? $900? Yeah. 
And if you were the buyer's agent, does it make sense you would do the same thing over on the other side? Mm -hmm. All right. So now that we've done that, do you get why we call this? Well, I'll say we call this a tree because it's kind of like a family tree. Yeah. <laughs> and one of the things you can say is, did you notice we have this hundred thousand dollars? We multiplied by six percent. And if you have that $6,000, you can multiply by 50%. And once you have that $3,000, you multiply by 70%. So when you get this, you multiply, that's a D, down. Multiply but down. a problem could tell you this number right here. Let's pretend, and I'll use a different color. Let's say this problem said that the... This is be the buyer's agent. The buyer's agent got a check for $4,200. And you're supposed to find what the sales price was. Like instead of starting at the top and working down, they're asking you, oh, if it's $4,200 and this person got 70% and that the broker got 30% and there was a 50% split and all these other things, sometimes they ask you to go up. And this is your unknown. Okay. You can still make this tree, but what you would do to answer that is you would take, oh, the 4,200 and divide by 70%. And whatever that number is, you would divide by 50%. So when you go up, you divide. I like that. That makes, that makes me happy. <laughs> Good, good, good. Well, I give all credit to Travis for that one. I mean, I've got a little form and he does too to make it pretty. But here's the thing. When you go to your test, you can't have that form with you. You have mm -hmm. to be able to draw it out for yourself. Yeah. So now that we know that, I'm going to go ahead and I'll make that smaller. I'm going to draw out the tree just in general. Because I know there was a sales price and it's going to be something. And from that sales price, there's going to be some percentage of commission. And that's going to give me a total commission. And we know that total commission is going to be split by the listing firm and the selling firm for some percentage. And then that amount is going to go between the agent and the broker. for some percentage. So do you think you could confidently, after you practice this a couple times, do you think that you could make this tree? Yes. Awesome sauce. I like it. I'm a very, I feel like I'm a visual learner too. So I'm like, oh, I like this. <laughs> like make it, a make it all pretty. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So now we can put in the numbers where they belong. Kathy is a salesperson who receives 40% of the total commission received by her broker. Where would we put that 40% in here? Um, would that be the percent commission between the sale price and the total? Well, no, because that would be, that would be she's getting 40% of the sales price. Is she really taking home 40% of the sales price? No. And is she getting 40% of the total commission? No. She's getting 40% of what her broker took in. Remember, her broker or her firm takes in some portion of that total commission. And then she's yeah. going to get 40% of that. It's not very pretty. Let's do this. 40%. Does that make sense why we're saying that? Yes. So then the broker is taking home 60%, 60. of whatever that is. That makes sense. 
All right, so that's our first number. So she got 40% of whatever the broker got. And it says, what is the broker's net share of the commission? So that's what we're looking for. We're looking for the, the broker share. This is what we want to know. Hmm. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's great. And then it tells me the house sold for $925,000. Where are we going to put that? Top of the tree. All right. And the commission rate, it's 5%. Where are we going to put that? In the parentheses? Is that one? Yep. The between? Mm -hmm. Because that is that seller was paying a 5% commission. And then it says a cooperating broker received half of the commission. What does that mean? I'm stumped. Well, that's okay. Think about it. Let's say this is ABC. And this is X, Y, Z. And let's so pretend for a moment that you actually are the agent over here. The seller paid the commission. So how are you, the buyer's agent, going to get paid? You see what I'm saying there? There's a problem. Yeah. And the way it generally works, now there are some lawsuits and this may change in the future, oh. but where generally, the way it generally works now is the seller pays this 5% commission to the listing firm. And when the listing firm got the listing and put it in the MLS, they promised to pay half of that to the selling, the, 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 the buyers. Yeah. So half is 50%. That's how you get paid as if you were on the buyer side. Because the seller paid the total commission to the listing firm. And then the listing firm agrees in the MLS, hey, if you find the buyer, we'll give you 50% of what we're getting paid. And of course, that 50% is going to be going to the, the broker. And then that broker splits it with you. And that goes down from there. So does it make sense why the 50%, that half goes here? And then the other half would go. Exactly. Go over okay. here. So it's a 50-50 split. 50-50 split. Oh. Now we've got our numbers in. So we can, if we're going down, do we multiply or do we divide? Multiply. So we're going to take that 925 and multiply it by 5%. What do you get? Multiply by 5 46,250. Let's see, 925 times 5%, 46,250. And I'm going to change colors just because I don't want us to lose it. It is 46,250. That is the total commission of 6%. You don't get to keep that 6% because we know that's what the brokers, the broker got. And he's got to split that with the other office. So at a 50-50 split, aren't we going to take that 46 to 50? And we're going to multiply by 50%. And what do you get? 46 to 50 times 23,125. Very good. 23,125. So that means this side gets 23, 125, and this side gets 23, 125. Is that what you get a check for, 23, 125? Is that your check? Mm -hmm. No, because that's, that's what the whole firm got. That's what the broker got. Mm -hmm. Now, it does say that the agent gets 40%, and we could figure out that meant the broker gets 60%. But what is the question asking us for? What is the broker's net share of the commission? So do we really need to find this? No. So we could go straight to what the broker is. How do we find 60% of 
of 23,125. So this is going to be multiplying? Because they're going, going down. down. Yeah. So 23,125 times 60%. $13,875. I'm like so excited right now. I'm like, oh I my gosh. <laughs> I love this. I love the tree. <laughs> the tree is great. That is why I blatantly stole it from Travis. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Oh, Travis. <laughs> yes, right. It's just such a good visual. Such a good <laughs> visual. I love it. I'm very happy right now. <laughs> Yay. All right, you ready for the next one? Yes. Cool. Sam would like to net 135,000 from the sale of his house. If his closing cost will be $1,200 and the broker's commission rate is 6%, the gross sales price of his house should be. Now, you can be honest. Do you have any way, do you know where you're gonna start? Do you? Um, I feel like I would end up, if I was like taking a test, I would break it up. I'd be like, okay, he well, wants the net 135. I think I just, I overcomplicate it because I just try to put the numbers. I just Yeah. Okay. Well, this is going to have a visual too. So I want you to percent pretend, you know, you know, in elementary you were learned, oh, this is a hundred percent is the circle, right? Mm -hmm. So that circle is a hundred percent and that hundred percent is what the sales price needs to be. All right. Now off the bat, this seller is like, look, I need $135,000 net, which means that's what the seller wants to put in his pocket after he's paid all of his expenses and paid your commission. So if we sell the house for $135,000, is there any money to pay your commission or any other things rolling on? No. So you have to sell the house for more than $135,000. Yeah. What other things does this seller need money for? Uh, commission. And how much is that commission? The commission rate is 6% closing. Okay. Just just put 6% there. And is there anything else he needs money for? What do no? Look in the problem. Closing costs? There we go. <laughs> How much are those? Uh 1200. So we know he can't sell it for $1200. He's definitely going to be short. And he can't sell it for $135,000 altogether. What he needs is one hundred and thirty-five thousand. Plus, he needs another twelve thousand or twelve hundred. Then he needs six percent of whatever he ends up selling the house for. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. That's everything. If we need to know the minimum sales price, it's got to be higher than one thirty-five. It's got to be higher than adding twelve hundred to that, and then you need to add another six percent of what you actually sold it for. Now, I'm going to change my thing to red because I'm going to show you something. I'm going to go backwards. Do you remember this problem? Yes. And when we got paid our commission, we got 5% off the total sales price. And what it's really tempting to do is when you get a problem like this is to take the 6% and multiply it by the 135. Or sometimes those people will say, let me take this 135 and add 1,200 to get, what is that, 136, 200? And then they'll multiply that by 6%. But here's the problem. If you do that, you got paid off of just this amount. Mm -hmm. Is that what you want? Did you want to get paid off a partial? Right. That's why you can't do that. Mm -hmm. And I promise you, if you do do that, and then add that number all together, that number will be an answer choice because they know that's what people think they want to do. Ixnay, not us, not what we're going to do. 
what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, well, if we know the entire circle is 100%, mm -hmm. and if this portion right here is 6%, what does it make the rest of this? If the total is 100 and we take off the 6%, what does it make the green? 94%. Very, very, very good. So we know that 94% of whatever the total minimum sales price needs to be is that 135 plus that 1200. Helps if I put the commas in the right place. <laughs> For 136.2, 136.2. If this man sells the house, I mean, Sam could be a woman, I guess. But if this person sells their house for 136.2, we mm -hmm. don't want commission off of that. That's just a portion. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes. So really what we found out is whatever the, the sales price is, 94% of that is 136, 200. Do you see how I made that like math sentence there? Yes. We know there's going to be a sales price and we know 94% of whatever that number is, is 136, 2. Do you know how to solve for this unknown? Uh, divide. There we go. So if we take the 136.2 and we divide by 94% because what you're saying is 36.2 is 94% of some larger number. What do you get? Let me check here. 136 divided by 1. What'd you get? I got a number, but I think I put it in backwards. Because I got 144. No, that's right. Well, they, is, oh. You're looking for 94% of a number. So 94% is pretty close to 100%. So is 144,000 close to 136,000? Yes. That's why you're right. Mm -hmm. 61, 62. So that meant our 100 is 144, 893, 61. That's our answer. I like it. Most importantly, or I would say more importantly, do you understand why you can't do this step up here? Why you can't just find 6% of 136? Uh, y yes, kind of. Would you mind explaining it though? Okay, I don't mind. So we understand that 136 is this combination right here, right? Mm -hmm. So if you multiply that to find your commission, you would be cheating yourself out of money. Because we just figured out the house needs to sell for 144. Let's just call it 145. Would you rather be paid commission off the total sales price of 145 or a portion of the sales price, 136? The 145. So if you find 6% of 136, you just cut yourself out of some money. That's a sad day. Does that make sense now? Good. And so what I encourage people to do is every time you have a problem like this, go ahead. You know there's going to be a commission and then just fill in everything else. I like it. I like it a lot. Yay. I like that you like it. Yay. All right. You ready to go to the next one? Oh, yeah. So it's another tax problem, but it's different than Mills. 
So let's read it. If the assessed value of a property is $440,000 and the annual taxes are 6509, what is the tax rate per 100? So, well, <laughs> yeah, it, it's 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 a lot, but that's okay. Now, the first thing we want to talk about is, well, we just did taxes and we did mills. Mm -hmm. And I don't see the word mills because this isn't a mills problem. If you go to Target and you want to buy something, you could pay cash or you could use your, you know, your phone or, or debit card or credit card, right? Mm -hmm. Well, when it comes to taxes in the United States, you get two options. You could do mills. Or you could do it based off the number of 100s in the value. Right. So yes. we did the math and we knew mills had to go off of thousands. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, we're doing something different. It's per 100. So we're going to let this part go. And what they're saying is, look, let's pretend the value of your house, the assessed value of your house is based off of $100 bills. For every $100 bill of the assessed value, you owe us some amount of money. Kind of like, and I'll say this, we'll just go here. I often refer to sales tax because you know with sales tax, it's per $1. If you buy something for a dollar, and your tax rate is eight cents, then you know your tax amount is gonna be eight cents. But if you buy something and you give that person $2 bills, then you're gonna pay that 0 0.08 times two, and now your taxes are 16 cents. And if you buy something for $5, you're paying that 0.08 five times and your taxes are 40 cents. You get how sales tax works, right? Mm -hmm. Well, what we're saying this time, I'll change colors. When it's real property taxes, we're doing it per $100 bills. So if your property has an assessed value of 100, they're going to tell you your tax rate is, I'm going to say, $1.50. So that means your tax amount for the year would be worth $1.50. You live in a cardboard box. But uh, if you I have a somewhat nicer cardboard box where the assessed value is $200, wouldn't you be paying $1.50 times so your tax is going to be $3? Yes. Because you need to know how many 100s. If your real property, if your property is worth, and I'm just going to jump here, $200,000. What you need to know is how many $100 bills there are, because that's where this step comes from. How many, you need to know, hey, I'm multiplying by two because it's, there's $2 bills and $2. I multiply it by, by five because there's five $1 bills and $5. I multiply, this was two. I multiply by two because there's two $100 bills and $200. How many $100 bills are in $200,000? So how do we do that? We take this and divide by 100. Yes. Because we know we're going to pay $1.50 times whatever that number is. 100. 2,000? 200,000 divided by 100 is 2,000. And do you know the trick? Since I'm dividing by 100, I just take off some zeros. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So what is $1.50 times 2,000? $3,000. Very good. Now, what this problem is telling you is they're giving you this amount. They're giving you this tax rate, and they want you to find this. 
They're asking us to go backwards. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, before we do that, I want to talk about this problem here. Would you agree what we did was step one, we took, let me change colors, just like it to be easier on your eyes. Mm -hmm. We took $200,000 and divided by 100. And that gave us 2,000. And then step two, we took that 2,000 and we multiplied by $1.50. And that gave us 3,000. And I want you to remember that because what we're going to do is now this will be our unknown. They're going to give us this number and then we don't know this. So we're going to divide. We're working this math backwards. Okay. So having said that, what we know is, and I'll just go bloop, 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 bloop here. We know there's going to be a very not pretty letter I just wrote there, an assessed <laughs> value. And then there's going to be a tax rate. And then there's going to be a tax amount. Like It doesn't matter what kind of taxes it is. This is what's going to happen. Do we know the assessed value according to this problem? Yes. What is uh, it? Uh, 44, zero, 440,000. Yeah. yeah. Too, many <laughs> Too many fours do and zeros. Know, do we know a tax rate? The ta no, that's what we're trying to figure out. Yeah. And do we know a tax amount? Would that be the um, 6509? Yep. So we also know that you had step one. We took the sales price and we divided by a thousand. And that gave us the number of, oh, sorry, not a thousand by a hundred. Doop. You know, when you divide by a thousand, the reason I said it would be if it's factors. So I'm just going to take a side note and I don't know if this will help you, but taxes can be per 100. Factors, when you're doing P&I, they're based off of thousands and mills are based off of 1,000. Just, I like to think of it as a mill factory. A mill, mm -hmm. like, you know, you think about a factory, you know, where they're milling out stuff. Factory mills, they're kind of related. Those are things based off of a thousand. Taxes, and I know this sounds silly, but usually when you pay sales tax, it's a dollar. So it's like there's an imaginary period there. Like, I think, oh, taxes, when I pay sales taxes, I pay per dollar, and a dollar is like a hundred. Like, I don't know if that's, do you get what I'm saying there? Yeah, yeah. So that <laughs> might help you. When you see mills and you see factories, factors, think thousand. When you see taxes per 100, think that 100. Okay. So in step one, what we did is we divided by, but now you get why I said a thousand off the top of my head, because sometimes we do do that. Mm -hmm. But this is taxes, the dollar, 100. So we took step one, we took the sales price, we divided it by 100, and we got the number of 100s. And then step two, we took that number of 100s, and we multiplied by the tax rate, and that gave us the tax amount. That looks familiar, correct? Yeah. So now let's fill in the information. Our tax amount is, oh, not what we want, boop, boop. Our tax amount is 6509. We don't know our tax rate. And then do we have a way to find the number of hundreds in 440,000? Yes. Yeah, we uh, can do that. We can say 440, and this said sales price, but it should have said assessed value. 
We can take 440,000 divided by 100, and that gives us 4,400. Mm -hmm. And I can put that 4,400 right here. Do you know how to solve for this if you've got the other two numbers? If you subtract? You don't subtract. What you know is on this equal sign, what you do to one side, you want to do to the other. And we're trying to make this be by itself. And right now on the left side of this equation, we were multiplying by 4,400. To get rid of multiplication, you take the opposite, which is dividing. So if we want to get rid of this part, we got to divide by 4,400. And what we do on one side, we have to do on the other. So our unknown number is equal to 6509 divided by 4,400. Bye-bye. What did you get? I got 1.4793. Yeah, so $1.47. That's your tax rate. Word. They were saying you're paying $1.47 for every 100 of the assessed value. Hmm. Now, this one... It's a little bit more steps, but what I tell people is you got to memorize this as the, it's like what you're, like if you want to write kind of an image or know what to write down, when you see taxes like this, if you can remember to write this down, then you can get to this because you know, oh, there's an assessed value and I have a tax rate and I use that tax rate to get to my tax amount. You think that would work? Yes. Good. I like it. I like it. Good. All right. Ooh, and a, a proration problem is next, it looks like. A property sale will close on March 31st, 2021. Taxes are fifty three sixty per the year uh, and are paid through the first half of 2020. Calculate the seller's share of taxes using a 365-day calendar. Now, the first thing I look at when I see this problem, I'm like, why? Why are we going for more than one year? You are just trying to make my life difficult. But that's okay. It's okay. So on proration problems, I like to draw out my years like this. So this is going to be 2020. And this is going to be 2021. And we know our tax bill is 5360 for year 2020 and 5360 for all of 2021. So if you are the owner, if you own the house in both 2020 and 2021, if we take that 5360 and multiply by two, then you would owe $10,720. Yikes. Yes. Over, you got two years to pay him. But that's not what this scenario is saying. Let's pretend now that you're the buyer. And let's pretend that your taxes are going to be due on January 31st. Like on January 31st, this closing happened March 31. By the end of December... They're looking at you because remember, real property taxes are a specific lien. They attach to the property. And on December 31st, when they're like, hey, where's our tax bill? You are the buyer and they're looking at you for whatever's missing. Do you think that's fair? I mean, you've owned it from here to here. But according to the problem, the last time that taxes were paid, was just from here to here. That That's what was paid taxes. And we get that they're going to be looking for 
all of this. So how are you feeling about paying all of the green, even though you only owned in the red? Upset. Right. What would make you feel better? If I only had to pay the amount in which I was living in the yeah. property. For. Wait, so what we're going to do is say, look, seller, you owe me for all of this. Mm -hmm. I'll cover after March 31st. But you still need to pay for the time where you owned it. Yeah, you might have paid halfway through. You might have paid halfway through 2020, but you need to pay for the rest of 2020 and you need to pay for January, February, and March of 2021. And you need to write me that check so that when the bill comes here, I can pay your portion with your money. Mm -hmm. So that was a lot. How does that feel so far? We're treading. We're treading the waters. Treading the waters, but do you understand why? Yes. Cool. So tell me why we only want the purple from the seller. We only want the purple because that's what the par portion they owned, correct? Yes, exactly. Okay. And why are we not collecting the yellow from the seller? Is that when they, that's already been paid? Exactly. Because it that's says they were paid through the first half of 2020. And how come we're not collecting the red today? Because that would be our portion? Yeah. And that problem asked us to calculate the seller share. Feel better now? You feel better. I I had a color code everything on my end. That's okay. No, that's that's why I use the colors when I explain it. It's just a little easier. Yeah. So I'm going to say, let's take a look and let's do this by year. Some people would say, why don't just add all the days together? But I want to look at it separately by year and then add it. I like that. So let's start with 2020. It is... 5,360 for the year. And this guy owes half the year. So couldn't I just divide by two? Mm -hmm. What do you get when you get that? Do that. I got 2680. So we know that's one number. That only gets us to 2020. Like to the end of 2020. Let's talk about 2021. What portion of the year 2021, what dates does this seller owe for? From just 2021. Oh, March 31st. Okay, March 31st. But Wait. does does this help if I do this? So this shows you between January 1st through 1231. This shows you of 2020. This shows you between January 1st through December 31st of 20. You know what I'm trying to say. Yes. So what portion, what date is in the purple in year 2021? The 1231. What's the purple section? I'm so good. I'm confusing myself over here. <laughs> That's okay. Stop. Stop. Brain reset. Brain reset. You're buying the house in 2021 on March 31st. Yes. Do you own the house for all of the year? No. What part of the year? What dates? If you're buying it on, 2030, on March 31st, who owned the house from January 1st to March 31st? The seller. So what is the seller's portion of 2021? The January 1st? Yep. Through March. March 31st. But let that sink in. Does that make sense why we're saying that? Yes. Because it's focusing on just that year. I need a let's look at that bowl. Yes, we're focusing on it by year. And in the year 
2021, he owns it in this purple section. Uh -huh. Does the visual now make sense to what you answered? Yes. Okay. So that is 1-1 one, one through 331. How do we know how many days that is? Well, we have to know how many days in January, how many days in February, how many days in March. Do you know how many days there are in January off the top of your head? No. Is that 31. bad? Sir. Okay. You know how many days there are in February off the top of your head? No. 28. And in March has 31. So I'm going to teach you a little trick. Make a fist. Now, look at your knuckles. Anytime we're on a knuckle, the part sticking up, think 31. Anytime we're in a valley, think 30. And you're going to start counting out the months using your knuckles and the valleys. So you start with January, which is on a knuckle. How many days does January have if it's on a knuckle? 31. Then you got February, which is a freak of nature because we know February doesn't always have 30 days or 31 days. It always has 28 days unless it's a leap year. Mm -hmm. And your test, it's never a leap year. It's always going to be 28. Okay. But after February comes March and now you're on a knuckle. So how many days are in, Feb in March? You're on another 31. April is in a valley. So how many days? Is it going to go back to 28? Well, only February has 28. So all the there others are going to be 30. Okay. So April's got 30. Well, there's still another trick. June, I'm um, sorry, not, we went from April to May. May is on a knuckle. How many days? 31. So keep making a fist because I want you to look. So now you're in your second to last, well, you're in your last valley, which is June. It's in a valley, so it's got 30. Mm -hmm. And then you got one more knuckle left, which is July. So how many days does July have? 31. You're out of knuckles. So what you're going to do is start over, which means August is back on a knuckle. So how many days does August have? 31. Exactly. And September is in a valley. So how many days does it have? 30. And October is on a knuckle. And we know Halloween is on the 31st. Right. And November is in a valley. So how many days were in November? 30. And then December is on a, a knuckle. So how many days in December? 31. The trick here is two things. Well, I guess three things. One, remembering 31 versus 30. Two, remembering Feb February is a freak of nature and only has 28. And three is both July and August have 31 days. All the rest of them went 31, 30, 31, 30, 31, 30, except for July and August because you run out of knuckles. I like that trick. All right. So we know that January has 31 days. February has 28 days. March has 31 days. So when we add that together, we get 31 plus 28 plus... 31. What'd you get? Oh, uh, okay. 31. 90. Very good. So we need to find 90 days of taxes. And we know for the year, 5360 is annual. Do you know how to make that into a daily amount? If there's 365 days in a year? Um, is this going to be dividing? Yes, very good. So we're going to take that 5360 and divide by 365 days. Because we're taking that tax amount and splitting it into 360 equal groups. Yes. So what do you get when you take that 5360 and divide it, divide it by 365? Uh, 14.68. 
That's what your daily amount is. You know taxes cost you $14.68 per day. And we're looking at 90 days. So 14.68 plus 90, or not plus, times 90. Gives you a total for how much for 90 days? 1321.2. 1468 times 90. Yep. I got 1,321.2. That's how much they owe for 2021. So we got a 2021 amount. We got a 2020 amount. If they owe 2680 for 2020 and 3120 for, uh, what am I trying to say? For 2021, how are we going to find a total? Just add it. Uh, yeah. 2680 plus 13, 4,001. There you go. How's that feel? I like it. I really like all these pictures and the colors. Like it just makes it, it's helping so much. I think the pictures and the colors help for me, but that's how I tend to learn. So same with me. It just brings me joy. <laughs> well, I like joy. Joy is good. There's not enough of it in the world. Exactly. All right. This is our last one. It's a little bit long, but that's okay. When I first tried this problem on my own, I think I spent almost an hour and then I just, there there was a lot of paper that was thrown. <laughs> I was so mad. I was like, oh. well, we're going to, this problem is all about organization. It's all about organization and it's about how the sales comparison approach works. So what do you know about the sales comparison approach? <laughs> you know what? Let's just start from the beginning. I don't care what you know. We're going to start from the beginning. That sounds right. beautiful. <laughs> so I can see, nobody else can see you, but I can see that you have on a lovely plaid, red and black plaid shirt. I am a girl from the 90s grunge. You're hitting my little grunge heart. My mama was just talking about me when I went shopping with her this past, you know, in the year 2023, we passed some plaid. She's like, oh, look, it's all of the 90s for you. And I was like, you know what? Thanks, Mama. I hear your dig. And I still like flannel. Thank you very much. Flannel is very useful. I don't think when people, when it's cold outside, you can put it on. It warms you up. When it's hot outside, you wrap it around your waist. You can now sit on it or wipe your sweat away. It gets used as a pillow. I just really think it's really underutilized. But again, oh, grunge. North Idaho, it's everywhere. <laughs> yeah, and because I mean, th there's a reason people like it. It's a reason why in the Northwest loves it. It is so... You don't put your flannels away for the summer. You just tie them around your waist because it's <laughs> yeah. going to get cold or chilly somewhere. And You're then you ramp. just put it. Yeah. I still think a t-shirt and some jeans and a flannel shirt tied around your waist is utilitarian and cute. Give me mm -hmm. some big boots. Perfect. And I really have gone back to the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I will probably listen to my Pearl Jam. So <laughs> <laughs> All right. So imagine you go to Marshall's or Ross Dress for Less. And in there, you see this shirt. I'm going to try to draw, but bless your heart, this could get ugly. So you have this flannel shirt. And it looks like this with these long sleeves. It's not the worst flannel shirt I've ever drawn. A plus. It's better than mine. <laughs> and it's red flannel. And then there's no price tag. And it's the only one. Would you agree what you do is you go and you grab the other flannel shirt that's also long sleeves. It's exactly the same thing, but it's blue. Mm -hmm. And it's got a price tag of $35. Don't you take both to the counter? 
Yes. And you're like, dude, if the blue one's 35, if then the red wants to be 35, we're all in a winner. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to, we're going to mutilate the flannel, flannel shirt. And I'm sorry. <laughs> so, this is going to be the same price. Maybe there is another shirt. But this one is short sleeved. And it's red. And pretend for one second, we pay by, we pay for clothing by how much fabric there is. As a woman, you know, this is a lie because you will pay more for a bikini than you will a full bathing suit, but that's okay. Let's pretend <laughs> you pay by how much, you know, fabric they use. And mm -hmm. they said that this shirt was $25. Well, if this one is $25 with less fabric, then our other one is going to be higher or lower. The original long sleeve? Yeah. Are you going to pay more for that or less for that? More. If, yeah. You're going to pay for more. Right. It's going to go, this price is going to be more. Oh. Or the opposite of that is we're going to say, hey... If this is $25 for less fabric, let's add, to, it would add $10 if it was more fabric, which means this price would now be $35, which means this one should be $35. Hmm. You see how we did that? Yes. We said, okay, well, with short sleeves, it's $25. If it had long sleeves, it would be $35, which means this would be $35. Mm -hmm. Well, then our third option is what if you had a shirt, but it was one of those, you ever see those shirts that are like long, they're almost like dress shirts. Yeah. You can wear it as a dress or you could wear it as a shirt. Like it's long. And this one is $50. Well, it's $50, but we, if it didn't have that amount of fabric, it would probably be $35. Mm -hmm. So that means, okay, it was $50 with all that fabric, but if we had less fabric, it would be $35, which means then this would be $35. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes. That is the sales comparison approach. What, okay. Except instead of shirts, what we're going to use <laughs> is chimneys. Okay. And the sale comparison approach the appraiser says, oh, here's my subject property. And let's just say it had three levels. Our subject property has one chimney for the first floor and a second chimney for the second floor. And we want to know how much is this house worth? Now, the easy way to go about it is find one that's exactly the same. Mm-hmm. And if you can find it the same, then if this house was worth 450, 450,000, I should say, then we know that house is worth 450. Right? Because we didn't do anything. But the appraiser could find another house also with three floors, but it has one chimney and it's sold for 420. It is exactly the same, but with four, with one chimney, it mm -hmm. sold for four twenty. What we'd have to do is say, "Oh, you know what? If a chimney is worth thirty thousand, that means this house, if it had had two chimneys, would have sold for four fifty. Okay. So when we look at this, our comp is inferior to our subject. It's always about our comp. How does our comp compare to our subject? Would you agree our comp is inferior to our subject because it had one less chimney? Mm -hmm. So since the comp is inferior, we added $30,000. We added to make it the same. So our comp is inferior, so we added. 
But what's that government agency? Oh, yeah. CIA. If your comp is inferior, you add. Because it was only one chimney and was 420, we added 30,000. So that means we added to get a total of 450. So we could say, oh, well, if that's our only comp, then it should sell for 450. Yes. But maybe they found a comp where it looked like, you know, basically the same. But this thing had three chimneys. Okay, that just, I should not be an architect. Let's <laughs> at least make them the same level, Candace. I mean, so this one's like there, and then that one's there, and that one's there. Actually, I like the other way better, but whichever. So that means our comp is not inferior. It is better. So if this thing sold for 480 with three chimneys, if it had two chimneys, would it have sold for more or would it have sold for less? If it if had it would have been less. There you go. So let's if a chimney is worth thirty thousand dollars, instead of two, if we want instead of three, we wanted two, we'd subtract one thirty thousand chimney. That makes sense? Yes. So that means it should have sold for four fifty. So when the comp is better, we subtract from the comp. Notice I'm doing all this math to the comp. Never mm -hmm. add and subtract to the subject. You say, I have this comp. I need to make it match. Once I know how much the matching comp is, then I move that number over to the subject. Only ever touch your comp. Okay. Right. So C B S. What is that home of the best shows like Criminal and um Criminal Minds? I'm so mad that Criminal Minds doesn't come on anymore. And then you have Young Sheldon, and it was the home of the Big Bang Theory. I mean, there's so many really good shows on CBS. Exactly. I don't know if you're watching that TV show Ghost that comes on CBS, but if you're not, you need to be. It's really good. I might have to check that out. Oh, yeah. It's about this young couple. It's from England, but, you know, kind of like The Office was in England. They brought it here. Same thing. It's about this young couple that moves. The, the woman inherits a house, and it turns out it's haunted, and she can hear and see those ghosts. And it's really good. It's so good. It's so funny. It's one of my favorites. So, CBS, if you're listening to me, love it. Please bring it back. I know there was a strike, but I need to know what happens to the ghosts. I need Wait, so what the, what's that streaming on right now? Or uh, it... The CBS, which is Paramount. Okay. Paramount. It's so good. I'm going to check that out. Yeah. Oh, there's so many good TV shows. I could do a whole thing about TV shows, Candace. Oh, watch. I have like, so many. There are so many. Are you watching Found on NBS, on NBC? I am not. <gasps> Stop the presses. I know this is a math class, but I need you to watch all, like, I think we're on episode eight. It is about this woman. It's, so let's say it's me. Because this woman is my heart. I love her. I get cat kidnapped when I'm like 16. And the man who kidnaps me, I escape. But to make meaning out of all of this, what I've done with the rest of my life is when somebody's missing, let's say you had a little sister, she got missing, you would call me and I would find her. It's the, it's, is this new, right? This is new. And then okay, I need to start watching it. That was you need so to watch good. it because I'm not spoiling anything because they tell you in the preview. But at the end of the first episode, you find out that I found my kidnapper and I have him chained up in my basement. It looks insane. I'm like, it's so able to turn. Mark Paul, the guy who played Zach Morris on Saved by the Bell, is so friggin' handsome. If you're listening, Mark Paul, you're beautiful. Like, you're I beautiful. love you. <laughs> Like, I know I'm supposed to be like, not liking the bad guy, but I'm like, oh, why is he so hot? So I'm like, I probably would fall for him. God. But it's such a good show about how, you know, they have, she's got him locked up in the basement and he's, because he's like really smart, he's helping her solve some of these crimes, but she hates him. But, and he's like, how can you hate me when you're doing the same thing to me with that I did to you? Like, it's so good. 
Oh, I'm, also, I will be watching that tonight. She is kick ass. She found this man and locked her, locked him in her basement. That's what she did. Love it. Yeah. Okay. Back to real estate. That is related <laughs> to real estate because she has some in her house. House, real estate, it's all connected. So really? good. So oh, good. I will be watching that tonight. And when you finish the first episode, I want you to, to email me and be like, Candace, mm-hmm. now I've got to binge watch. I am first. <laughs> yeah, it's so good. Okay. okay. Yeah. I'll- <laughs> Speaking of TVs, it was all about CIA and CBS. If the comp is inferior, you add. Why are there no shows about the CIA? You got like NCIS, but how come there's not shows about the CIA? Hmm. Is it because they're supposed to be so like secret? Maybe. If anybody out here is watching this or listening <laughs> to this in the future, could somebody in the comments tell us why there are no shows about the CIA or are we just missing them? So if the comp is inferior, you add. And if the comp is better, you subtract. You can remember that, right? And we're actually, what I tell people is at the top of your test on this piece of paper, we're going to write CIA, CBS. So that way we know what we have, because what we have is this subject property. And then you have this comp property. And the subject property has three bedrooms. It's got two bathrooms and it's in good condition. And our comp property has three bedrooms. It has two and a half baths and is uh to, to do sold recently for two twelve. But I realized I missed it's also in good condition. If I could spell condition. There we go. <laughs> now first of all, do you see how I took what was in the problem and I laid it out yes I yeah. subject property I get it and I can eliminate some stuff right now because the things that are the same are we going to make any price adjustments for it Mm-mm. no the bedrooms are the same I don't need to make a price adjustment they're both in good condition I don't need to make a price adjustment so in this particular problem we only need to change one thing But in some of these problems, they might say, oh, this thing has a fireplace and this one doesn't have a fireplace. And then you would add that on. That's Mm -hmm. not in this problem. Luckily, they just gave us one thing to change. But you understand. Yeah. Yeah, it makes a lot more sense. Now, it gives us some more information. It says that the bedroom is worth $25,000. A half bathroom is worth $12,000. What is the indicated value of the subject? So what we have to do is turn our subject property into our comp. Mm -hmm. Our subject property has two and a half baths and our subject property has two baths. Is Is our comp better or is it inferior? The comp is better because and if the comp is better are we adding or subtracting subtracting so i'm just going to go ahead and put a big fat negative that's not what i want i'm going to put a big fat negative we're going to be subtracting now in this problem i can't this problem doesn't set you up to show you why but I'm going to show you the best way to do this. Actually, I'm going to show you the best way to do this. And then I'm going to find the problem to show you why you have to do it this way. Okay. Okay. So what I want you to do is come up with the value of both. Two ba- a two bath house would be at a half bath, 12,000. Wouldn't this be 12,000 times four? Do you get what I'm saying? Because... Two, it would be a half bath plus a half bath plus a half bath plus a half bath. 
So it'd be 12,000 times four. Now I will tell you, usually there'll be a line that says a half bath is worth 12 and a full bath is worth, I don't know, um, 15. It will okay. usually say something like that. But I'm going to go ahead and assume since they only gave us half bath, they want me to say, oh, well, two baths is four half baths. Do you get what I'm saying there? Yeah. So if I take 12 times four, that is a total of $48,000 in value from that half bath, that two baths. Two and a half baths would be the 12,000 times five, which is 60,000. And what's the difference between 60,000 and 48,000? 60,000 minus 48,000 is $12,000. If we want to make this equal, we need to subtract $12,000 from this total. So we're saying with two and a half baths, it's so for 212. If we subtract 12,000, then we know this house would have sold for 200,000, which means this house should sell for 200,000. I like that. That makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I want to go ahead and tell you, because I like to explain to you why we did it that way. Some people would have just said, oh, a half bath is worth 12. So if the difference is a half bath, just do it. That just Why didn't you just subtract 12? And let me find a math problem that shows you why that is not true. A few moments later. Okay. I think this one should work. In this problem, we're not doing the whole thing. It says the property has 50, the subject property has 52 square feet, 5,200 square feet, five bedrooms, four baths, and a fireplace and a two car garage. And the comparable property, 700,000, 540, or 5,400, five bedrooms, three and a half baths, no fireplace, and a three car garage. So well, we would make that chart, right? Yeah. And this problem also says a typical half bath is 3,500 and a full bath is 11,000. So what we're going to do is, if this problem is doing what I want it to do, what a lot of people would say is, well, the difference here is that you've got a three and a half bath versus a four bath. And the difference is a half bath. So I should just, and actually, I don't think this one will work. Uh, That one, let's see. Ah, let's try this one. Sorry to take you down that little train bunny trail for a second. Let's try this one because that one doesn't do what I need it to do. And it's all math related and I don't care. Subject property, two and a half baths. You got a comparable property and it is three baths. And a lot of people would say, oh, the difference here is if a half bath typically adds 75, 1750, then the difference is 1750. Does that make sense, Jess? Yes. Yeah. I see. So, but if we look, if we say, and hopefully this problem does what I want it to do, two and a half baths is worth. Well, it would be 2,500 plus 2,500 plus 1750 which is 2,500 plus 2,500 plus 1,750, which is 6,750. And then if we do three baths, it would be 2,500 plus 2,500, which is 2,500, which is gonna, that's 25,250. I don't even know what I was writing there. Which is 7,500. So the difference in value, 7,500 minus 6,750 
is $750. That's a different number than if you said, oh, it's a half bath versus a full bath. Mm -hmm. A lot of people would have just said, oh, the half bath is $1,750. So let me adjust plus or minus $1,750. And if you were to do that on this problem, do you see you would be wrong? Yeah. And I wanted to show that to you. And I know some people are like, why are you going through all this? Because if you had just done, if we had done the problem the way we did a second ago, yeah, it would have come up right. You would have said, oh, the difference between three baths and two and a half baths, it, because it only gave us one number. I could only do one thing there. Mm -hmm. But I wanted you to see why what you want to do is come up with the difference in the values. We found both values, then found the difference. What you can't do is say the value of the difference. The difference is a half bath and a half bath is worth X. Nope, that gets you to wrongness. We don't want wrongness. We don't want wrongness. We have to find the value of this one, the value of that one, then subtract. Or what some teachers will tell you to do is, well, Two and a half baths is equal to two fulls and one half bath. And then you come up with the value. So you come up with the value of the fulls and then you come up with the value of the half. That would work too if you separate them out. But you can't just say, oh, the difference is a half bath. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Now, having said that, one of the things that you said is this problem the first time you did it took you 20 minutes. And for that reason, there are two types of problems I tell people save for last. This problem, now this one was kind of shorter because you only had one difference. Mm -hmm. But when I went back to this problem where there's three different differences, can you see how long it's going to take? Oh, wow. yeah. <laughs> it. It's the same point value as every other problem. Save that for later. Okay. Or... Not or. And sometimes you get those problems that say the buyer's sales price was this. The loan amount was that. They had to pay interim interest. They needed to know a tax proration. Like how much total cash does the buyer need to bring to closing? Have you seen those problems? Those take forever too. Do I want you to know how to do them? Yes. Do I think you should waste 40 minutes of your time? Because if you get one of those calculations wrong, the whole problem's wrong. Save it for last when you know, hey, if I run out of time, I just missed one problem versus mm -hmm. if I spend all my time getting this one problem right, I missed out on 17 other problems. Yeah. Does that help? It does help. Oh, I'm so excited. All right. Well, I'm so glad we got through. We've been doing it for a while. And I told you this last problem takes a while, but it can be worth it if you have the time. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, then we're going to do this again. And next time we do it, we'll do it on flashcards and how to use flashcards properly. I need to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, then I will see you next time and have a good day. Okay. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>